Hello, everybody. Hello. Why are you smiling, Samir? It's been a long time. Did you miss us? Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> All right. Um, because I've been gone so long and missed you so greatly, I do have a few opening opening uh, comments to make. So just please bear with me as uh, as I work my way through this. First, I think and I hope that you've seen my statement we just put out on the uh, uh, situation politically in Bahrain. Um, I don't want to rehash the whole thing for you, but I do want to make clear that uh, we are deeply troubled by today's alarming move by the government of Bahrain to dissolve the opposition political society, al Wafak. Uh, we are following the situation closely, as I think you can imagine we would, and we urge Bahraini officials to reconsider this decision. As we've consistently maintained, peaceful criticism of the government plays a vital role in inclusive, pluralistic societies. Bahrain has made some progress recently in addressing the concerns and the grievances of its citizens since the events of 2011. The government's action today against al Wafak is not consistent with a commitment to sustaining that progress or to pursuing unfulfilled reforms. On Ukraine, we welcome Russia's decision to exchange Yuri Soloshenko and um, I'm going to try to get this right, Hanadi. Alfonasiev, Alfonasiev, for se uh, 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 for separatists that were convicted in Ukraine. Now, these two individuals, like many other Ukrainians still in Russian custody, were convicted on trumped-up, politically motivated charges. Their release is another important step in fulfilling Russia's commitments under the Minsk agreements, and should now provide impetus for the complete implementation of those agreements, including releasing all other hostages and unlawfully detained persons. Just a note on uh, the Secretary's travels. I know you know he is uh, in uh, Santo Domingo today. Um, he is participating in the General Assembly of the Organization of American States, the Western Hemisphere's premier multilateral organization. This morning, uh, and if you haven't seen his comments, uh, they are posted on our, our website now, he spoke about the important role that the OAS plays as a platform to promote a hemispheric commitment to the values of representative democracy, human rights, inclusive development, and hemispheric security. He also discussed our support for the Inter-American Human Rights Commission and efforts to combat corruption and increase transparency in the hemisphere. And he reiterated our longstanding position of the need for a national dialogue in Venezuela to address their challenges. He also called for the release of political prisoners. The Secretary expressed our concern as well for the situation in Haiti, and he made clear that the people of Haiti deserve a chance to express their will and elect a president without further delay. Now, as also part of his uh, schedule uh, today, he met uh, with uh, the conference's host, Dominican President Medina, and reinforced our commitment to a strong bilateral relationship. He underscored in that meeting the need to resolve the risk of statelessness facing Dominican-born people of Haitian descent and uphold the country's obligation to combat discrimination based on race, ethnicity, and national origin. Finally, today, as you, the Secretary is, as we speak, meeting with Venezuelan Foreign Minister Rodriguez. Uh, the meeting is providing the uh, Secretary an opportunity uh, as well to exchange views and to reiterate our, our, our call for national dialogue in order to find solutions to the political, economic, human rights, and social challenges that are facing Venezuela right now, as well as to call for respect for the co constitutional mechanisms, including the recall referendum process. Uh, I think we'll probably have a more detailed uh, readout of the meeting when it's over. Uh, finally, as part of the White House's Unite the United State of Women Summit, First Lady Michelle Obama will deliver remarks here at the State Department this evening. The dinner, co-hosted by the State Department's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women, will highlight women's economic empowerment and the government-wide efforts surrounding Let Girls Learn, as well as new commitments by organizations in the private and nonprofit sectors to support adolescent girls' education. With that, Brad. Can I start with um, Can we start our with our Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I um, uh, just wanted to ask, uh, firstly, what are the consequences if Bahrain doesn't reconsider this as you urged 
Well, I, I don't think it's useful to get into consequences at this point. Um, Bahrain knows uh, what a close friend and partner the United States is, how deeply we are, are committed to that relationship, and committed, quite frankly, to Bahrain's success. Um, and as I said uh, in the opening statement, um, that this decision itself is not, uh, we don't believe, in, in the spirit of, and certainly not in keeping with, the, the kinds of progress they have been able to make on, uh, on the human rights and uh, on the human rights front um, in, in just the last couple of years. Um, so it, it's not about, uh, it, it's not about uh, a threat of a threat of, of some sort of specific consequence here, Brad. It's it's about a good friend expressing a very deep and genuine concern to another good friend. We've heard a lot. We we hear from you talk about vague talk about progress, but it, it's becoming harder and harder for a lot of independent observers to see. Uh, opposition party shut down, independent center of human rights uh, president or, or head arrested. Uh, pressure on independent media. I mean, what is this progress that you speak of? They have uh, created some new institutions in the government uh, that have helped improve oversight and accountability over the security institution. As, as you remember, uh, it is still the security institutions that uh, that we uh, uh, that we continue to have the most concern about. Um, but we've also been honest that more work needs to be done. So there has been some uh, oversight and accountability progress made. Um, uh, but we, again, we're, we're very honest about the fact that uh, there, there needs to be more work. Did you actually and then I have just one more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> why didn't the Secretary raise any of these issues in depth when he visited Bahrain? I mean, they're not new issues, uh, the lack of implementation on its human rights reforms. Um, I think he made very sparing reference, but he didn't really address uh, crackdown on civil society, uh, crackdown on independent press. He, he kind of just brushed over the whole problem. No, I would – I totally disagree with that, Brad. I mean, he, he absolutely raised uh, our concerns over the human rights situation in Bahrain when we were there. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's because we have such a close relationship with Bahrain, we can have those kinds of very frank discussions. And he, he very much raised it. I don't, I don't and it know. has – how did he, he didn't he didn't condemn any specific action he uh, he even I, I think he stood there and since he hasn't done that much even though it took I don't know months for someone they promised right in front of him to be released immediately he was he was very uh, restrained at the time. You're talking about in the press conference. I'm talking about in the actual meetings and and uh, and I can assure you that he did raise our concerns about human rights situation there um, and about our desire to see uh, Bahrain be as successful as it can be. And we continue to believe that that kind of success is derived best through free and open uh, e expression of views and, uh, and in, uh, espousing uh, an opposition that uh, can peacefully uh, articulate the uh, concerns that they that they have about the, the decisions that the government makes. Um, that is not something that he was at all bashful about in speaking with Bahraini leaders. Now, uh, we could argue whether or not you thought there was enough emphasis placed on it when he came out and did the press conference, but I can assure you, um, having been in the room for the meetings myself, that the secretary was, was very, uh, very candid about it. Has, has the secretary um, spoken to his counterpart or has any other uh, senior State Department official spoken to Bahraini officials about your dismay at this latest court ruling? We have uh, – I can, I can tell you that we have raised our concerns about this decision um, at various levels. I don't have any communications specifically by the Secretary to read out to you today, but I can tell you that we have uh, raised our concerns about this decision at, at various levels here at the Department. At, does that mean uh, beyond the embassy, in other words, here – from main various state. levels, so beyond high, the embassy. At high levels? At, at high levels, uh, various various and high levels here at the State Department. I don't have any specific communications on the Secretary's behalf to read out to you. Can you tell us who – I mean, if it's high, was it, you know, Assistant Secretary Patterson? I, I, I don't have the, the list, but I can tell you that it has been raised at various levels here at the Department. And to, you know, <clears throat> have there been any consequences for Bahrain since uh, 
uh, its uh, increasing suppression of dissent sin since 2011 uh, from the United States? Well, you know, there was uh, there was a, a prohibition on certain security assistance that had been that had been imposed uh, since 2011, and just several months ago, of course, we lifted part of it, but not all of it. Uh, because we still had some concerns about some of the security forces, uh, concerns which, as I mentioned to Brad, still exist. Um, uh, so it, it's not as if uh, we have uh, lifted all restrictions um, and, com uh, and completely, you know, absolved ourselves of the concerns that we still have uh, with Bahrain. And again, I can tell you this is something, this is a topic that, uh, that we routinely raise with Bahraini leaders. How do you address, just last one for me, how do you address critics who argue that um, the United States, uh, the value that the United States places on its strategic relationship with Bahrain and the basing of the Fifth Fleet there uh, means that it acquiesces in uh, human rights violations and the suppression of uh, democratic uh, uh, expression there. Well, I would tell such a critic to go look at our human rights report where we lay out our concerns very openly and honestly right there online. Um, I would also tell that critic to take a look at the, some of the decisions we made post-2011 to withhold uh, some security assistance material, um, which when you think about it, if you want to, if and I wouldn't agree with this characterization, but if you were going to characterize our bilateral relationship from a security perspective, I'm not arguing that that's what your question implies, but if that's the, that if you want to consider that the limit, then that decision alone, I think, speaks volumes about the fact that we're not bashful about uh, being clear uh, and firm about our concerns on the human rights fronts, because that is where some of the restrictions uh, in that sector uh, were placed. So I think we've been We've been open, we've been transparent, we've been forthright. Uh, it's all in black and white if you go look at the Human Rights Report. Um, and if we weren't, and if we didn't feel comfortable enough in the relationship, because it is a strong bilateral relationship, um, and we uh, greatly appreciate the, the assistance of Bahrain um, and the fact that they host uh, our, our Fifth Fleet there uh, and their contributions uh, in the region to larger security and counterterrorism efforts. But if, if, it, if it wasn't for such a strong partnership and such a strong bilateral relationship, I wouldn't have felt quite as free and easy as I did today in bringing this up right at the top uh, of the briefing, rather than the wait to be asked about this decision, just to go ahead and lay it out and be very clear about what our concerns are. Um, because we do have that kind of relationship. It's that strong that, uh, that we believe uh, that it can not only weather uh, these sorts of uh, uh, of disagreements over uh, over these developments, but that uh, the, that we can use this to, to work our way through it. Can I just ask about one more, and then I'll, I'll yield on, on Bahrain as well. Yeah. Um, if Kerry wasn't bashful in his meetings, and the relationship is so strong, how do you explain that they're doing exactly what you say they? shouldn't be doing? Do well, they do they not get it? Are they just not intelligent enough to see it? Or do they not care what you say or what? I think that's a great question for uh, officials in Bahrain, Brad. I can't speak for motivation here. Um, uh, they, they have to speak for the reasons. They have to speak to the reasons for the decisions that they've made. What I can speak for is our view of the decision, which we obviously don't approve of. But if, if you are trying to push respect for human rights, respect for democracy yeah. in all places, Bahrain included, what's your don't don't you try to figure out why your strategy is not working if it's not working? Would, don't you you know you come up well we pushed this but it clearly didn't work. They've done exactly what we didn't want to do. Do you try to figure that out, or do you just say, well, they just didn't agree with us on democracy this time? No, I don't think we take quite that glib approach to foreign policy, Brad. Obviously, uh, we certainly would like to have this decision overturned. Um, we, are, we are more concerned with, with that uh, and with uh, 
a process in Bahrain that, that values freedom of expression than we are with trying to dissect uh, the particular reasons why this decision was made. You know, just to follow up on the previous questions. Now, you, you mentioned the base in, in, in Bahrain. That ought to be like a leverage for you because you are providing Bahrain with a great deal of security that it needs. It did not need to be so, you know, insecure about its minorities and so on, uh, or the, the, the accusation that they levy on them, yeah. that they have connections with other countries. Look, as, and I so said, on. as I said to Brad, though, say, this isn't about, this isn't about uh, holding something over somebody's head and using leverage. It's about, it's about freedom of expression right. and, uh, and our desire to see this decision changed. But, you know, my point is that, you know, you, you're saying that a friend to friend, you mentioned something like this, you know, there's an element of some sort of uh, equanimity. But in fact, you, you, you know, by, I mean, you should be uh, leveraging your power uh, in, that, in that part of the world. And the fact that you have provided them with protection for over decades, not, not only years, uh, and, uh, you know, to basically say in public what you say in private. You say that in, in private you raise all these issues, but yet in the press conference you're not saying that. We have uh, – the relationship with Bahrain is long. Um, it exists on many levels, not just security. Um, as I said, we're grateful for them hosting uh, the Fifth Fleet, and we're grateful for uh, their contributions to regional security. Um, we have every expectation that that relationship – their contributions and ours, not just to the relationship but to the region, will endure and it will continue. Um, not just because it must, because of the threats, but because, uh, because we continue to believe that a multilateral approach to security issues in the Middle East uh, is absolutely vital. So it's in no one's interest, theirs or ours, uh, uh, to, to try to, uh, you know, render moot uh, any one part of the bilateral relationship with Bahrain going forward. Um, what matters to us, as I said at the outset, is Bahrain's success. Obviously what matters to uh, it, it, our bilateral relationship matters too, but, but Bahrain's success matters to us. And we've seen them make progress on some human rights issues. Not all. Recognize there's still a lot of work to be done. I said that. But they have shown that they, they can and they are willing and able to make progress. This decision seems to be stepping back from that, just certainly not in keeping with the kind of progress we know they can make. And so we're going to continue to urge them to do the right thing in this regard uh, and to reverse this decision. And I, I just think it's way too premature at this point to try to talk about repercussions and consequences as a result uh, of any uh, 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 reluctance on their part to, to do that, to overturn it. John, uh, yeah, on Michelle. this issue, the uh, Bahraini government has said that uh, al wifaq society was promoting the Iranian regime ideology or Wilayat al faqih uh, ideology. In this case, do you support their decision? Again, I'm going to let them speak to why they made the decision. We believe that this opposition group uh, what, what represents uh, uh, represents in its being uh, opposition political views peacefully expressed. And we continue to believe in freedom of expression there and everywhere. Uh, and we don't think this is in Bahrain's interest, ultimately, uh, this decision. We don't think it's in their interest. But in case they were promoting the Iranian ideology? I, I have nothing, I've seen nothing to indicate uh, uh, that, that that's the case. Does it concern you uh, that despite the Secretary's strong criticism of how the Bahrainis have handled human rights, that they went ahead and did this? Does it make the U.S. question whether the Bahrainis are taking this government's concerns seriously? And if that is the case, why won't you say what the U.S. is prepared to do in order to make the Bahrainis understand that human rights isn't just something that seems attractive when it might be politically expedient, I, that it has to be underscored no matter what. I think, I think Bahrain very much understands our concerns about human rights issues. And yet they went ahead and, and shut down al Wafaq. Right. I, I, I can't, again, speak for their motivation to do it. Um, but I tell you that they are very well aware of our concerns about human rights in that country. 
It, these are concerns we routinely raise, and we have, in fact, raised in this particular decision. We want them to do the right thing here, and we believe the right thing to do is to overturn that decision. And we're not at a point, since it just happened, uh, we're not at a point right now uh, where uh, it, 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 it does anybody any good to speak to specific consequences or repercussions. Let's continue to have the discussion. Let's try to get uh, uh, to a better outcome, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Are you suggesting that there might be a period of time that is acceptable to the U.S. government for al Wafaq to be closed or for any opposition political entity No, I'm not suggesting that closed? at all. I'm not suggesting that at all. No. Yeah. Party officials say Russian government hackers Wait, penetrated. Wait, are we done with Bahrain? Democratic Party officials say Russian government hackers penetrated the computer network of the DNC and gained access to the entire database of opposition research on Donald Trump. Can you support the claim? I, I would refer you to the DNC for comment on this. Uh, is the government looking into this? Uh, I, I'd re you'd have to talk to the DNC and to uh, the law enforcement authorities. Are U.S. This. authorities they looking into happened. this? They, they, we, we all talked to them. They said it happened. So, um, okay. All right. So, so now, that we, now that we've established that it happened, what do you think about Russians hacking into the DNC? And Look, I'm, I, I am, I'm not going to uh, get into a law enforcement issue here, um, particularly one where I'm not steeped uh, on the details. Um, the U.S. government uh, is the subject of countless cyber intrusions and attacks every day um, from all kinds of places. And it's a concern that we take very, very seriously. Uh, and it's a concern, frankly, that we raise internationally all the time uh, with, uh, with other countries uh, as we deal with them. So it's something we take seriously. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak to law enforcement authorities or to the DNC on, on this particular issue. They need to speak to that. Just to clarify, you don't know if the if the authorities are looking into this. I don't have uh, I don't have any more knowledge about this than I've just given you. I mean, I've these I've just seen these recent press reports. Um, I don't have anything to corroborate them. Uh, I refer you to the Democratic National Committee and to law enforcement authorities to speak to this to these reports. I just don't have additional info. Just more generally, under what circumstances is a hack considered uh, an act of war? I, I'm not going to speculate about that. But yeah. uh, previous uh, people who have held your position, John, have talked about hacking into U.S. businesses, whether it's from China, whether it's from North Korea, whether it's from Russia. Given that we're talking about an organization that, while it is technically a nonprofit, is a political organization and is part and parcel of the U.S. political system, is there, one, no real concern within the Obama administration about this, and two, have officials from the U.S. government expressed their concerns to the Russian officials about this incident? Well, on the, fir on the first question, is it of, concer of concern, the reports, and again, I'm only speaking to press reporting here, I don't have any direct knowledge about this case, uh, but obviously they're, they're concerning. Uh, uh, and if they're true, it would be a, a deep concern. And yes, you're right, it's not a U.S. government, you know, the Democratic National Committee is a political organization, not a U.S. government organization. Uh, but, but sure, that would be deeply concerning to us if it's true. I'm sorry, and your second question was? Have U.S. officials... Oh, have we... Yeah, have I, you expressed I, any concerns? I mean, it's been done before when it deals with... Speaking you know, with, with, with private companies and the U.S. government has spoken out about attempts to hack into private companies, yeah. why not talk about an organization that is part and parcel of the political system? It may not be an official government agency, but it is part of the system. Right. I'm not aware of any conversations that have happened. Uh, I, I can only speak for the State Department. I, I don't have any conversations uh, or communications to read out with respect to these reports. Again, these reports have, have just come in today. Um, and I'm talking off of press reporting solely. So I have no communications on behalf of the State Department to read out and refer to law enforcement authorities for, you know, if, if they have done any outreach based on this press reporting. I just don't know. Sorry, are, are any representatives from this building speaking to law enforcement officials on this issue? I'm not aware of any conversations. Pam. Saudi Arabia 
concerning the Secretary's meeting last evening with the Deputy Crown Prince. I saw the readout. It looks like they discussed a wide range of issues. Um, two questions. Did the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act come up? And then secondly, at this point, um, based on this meeting, how would you gauge at this point the level of Saudi concern about this measure? Uh, <laughs> well, I, again, I'd refer you to Saudi authorities to, to speak to their levels of concern uh, uh, yeah, about part of it. Uh, the, I think the readout was pretty comprehensive, um, and I'm not aware that it came up. I'm not aware that it came up. Could I follow up on the readout? On the readout? Sure. Okay. Now, it says that they focused on, on Syria, and apparently there are differences between your views and their views. They basically want to arm the, the Saudis. They want to arm the opposition with, let's say, anti-tank weapons, uh, uh, ground-to-air missiles, and so on. So you don't see eye to eye on this issue. On the issue of? On the issue of arming uh, the, uh, the opposition until they are able to bring down the Assad regime. That, that's basically what the Saudis want. So I'm, 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 you're, okay, I'm you're, trying to understand. Syria was a focus. Let's put it this way. Syria was a focus in these discussions, you know, as, as, as yeah. Yemen was and as Libya was and so on. But the Saudis on Syria, the Saudis want, you know, a different policy from you where you are, where you arm the, the opposition group, the Syrian opposition group with the kind of weapons that will empower them, let's say, in inflicting heavy damage that can bring the regime down, such as grant him. I'm sorry? He's waiting for a question. Well, there is my question. My question <laughs> is... No, wait, wait, wait I a still minute. didn't I, hear I, it. Let me, I'm, uh, but, so let me... Well, I'm not going to okay. make you do it a third time. Let me ask I think you. okay. if you're let me, asking if there's this big philosophical divide right. between the Saudis and the United States yes. on how to move forward on the ground in Syria, the answer is no. The, look, the, the Saudis are, were a founding member, quite frankly, of the ISSG. Um, and if it were not for Saudi leadership, we wouldn't have had that first meeting uh, of the Syrian opposition groups uh, back in December in Riyadh. Um, they have been at this right, at the, right from the beginning uh, with the United States and with Russia and with Turkey, uh, moving this process forward. Uh, everybody, and I, can, and, and I don't want to speak for a foreign government, but I'm, I'm comfortable in this regard saying that the, 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 Saudi, the Saudis share our concerns about trying to get to a negotiated political process in Syria uh, for a, a, a transition, uh, you know, a, a transitional process to get to a government in Syria that's not headed by Bashar al-Assad. And they have been, they have been leaders, quite frankly, in, in, in trying to help us get to that outcome. Now, we've got a long way to go. On the fight on the ground, I would remind you two things. It's, for the United States anyway, and for the coalition, it's about going after Daesh. It, it's not about militarily going after the regime. In fact, the second point, that's why we have a cessation of hostilities in place, fragile though it may be. And the Saudis were uh, key figures and key leaders in helping us get to that cessation of hostilities through, what, two, three different communiques and a UN Security Council resolution. So uh, we're all working at this problem very, very hard. I'm not going to speak for what they, what they you know, specifically want to do differently. That's for the Saudi government to speak to. But I can tell you that on the issues that matter, getting a cessation of hostilities that's nationwide and enduring, getting humanitarian access to the still thousands and thousands of Syrians that are still in need, and moving a political process forward that gets us to a government that's not led by Bashar al-Assad. Saudi, Saudi Arabia has been with us step by step. Okay, my last question on this. Well, the, in, li in light of Assad's statement last week that he is intent on liberating every inch of, of Syria, are you likely to change your policy towards arming the, the, the opposition with the kind of weapons that they If have? you're asking me based on his comments, comments that, comments that were were predictable if we're going to change the approach that we've taken inside the International Syria Support Group uh, towards where we're trying to get to in Syria, the answer is no. Uh, anything more on the, on the readout about their conversation um, about Orlando? It mentioned in there that they, they spoke about that. 
Uh, as I understand it, it was uh, 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 it was a general discussion. Obviously, um, uh, uh, the Crown Prince expressed their condolences uh, for the losses, and I think both he and the Secretary, in the context of speaking about the tragedy in Orlando, uh, uh, focused. I mean, use that as an opportunity to focus uh, uh, the conversation on the need to continue um, to fight the, the threat of terrorism in the region, and particularly the, the fight against Daesh. I mean, it was um, it was the, what happened in Orlando is a grim reminder of of how real the threat still is from terrorism, um, and uh, and an opportunity for both men uh, to talk about. Uh, the ways we w in which we need to continue to cooperate uh, towards towards that threat. Is there any discussion of Saudi funding for Wahhabist uh, schools outside of Saudi Arabia? I, I don't have anything beyond the readout in terms of the, uh, the communication to 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 talk about the 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 readout of the discussion, though general, is inclusive. Did did uh, Secretary? I'll I'll give it one more shot. Did the secretary raise the matter of LGBT rights with the Saudi Crown Prince? I'm not going to go beyond the readout. When you say that the readout, though, general is inclusive, do you mean that there is no topic that was discussed that is not referenced I think, in the I readout? think the, 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 the topics, the topics, uh, the topics that were discussed at the dinner were expressed in the readout. But the, so there were no other topics that came up? I, I'm comfortable with the with the inclusiveness of, of the readout. I'm, I don't have I don't have a more exhaustive list of topics to read out to you. It's a it's an accurate portrayal of the discussion over dinner. Sure. I mean I just the reason I'm harping on the word inclusive is I'm interested in the completeness of the readout. Do you regard it as a complete uh, readout? none of my readouts are complete in the in, in a literal sense. Um, in fact you guys never fail to let me know that. Um, they, they are readouts. They are summaries of uh, what can be very long discussions. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable that the readout accurately portrays both the tone and the, the, uh, and the tenor of the discussion as well as the major topics. Uh, I don't have any more additional detail of the conversation to read out to you. Well, maybe this, Wait, this, guy, uh, this guy, you guys all riled up the readout? Yeah, before we get on the vision, um, I, I just before we leave the, the question of Orlando, um, you said the Saudi crown prince expressed his condolences and that, that this, the matter was, the specific was, attack was discussed in general terms, which I'm I mean, not I mean, exactly it, 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 obviously, there was no the record. He's the deputy crown prince. I'm sorry, right? the deputy crown prince, thank you for the correction. The, look, uh, um, of course it came up. I mean, having just occurred and having been so tragic. But, um, but as I put in the, in the readout, um, you know, talking about what happened in Orlando um, and um, the manner in which people either become self-radicalized or uh, ascribe themselves or even travel to uh, the region to become members of or affiliated with groups like Daesh, uh, obviously led to, as you would expect it to lead to, a larger, deeper discussion on counterterrorism in general right. and, and the fight against Daesh. And my question is, in, in the realm of that discussion, was there anything that the Secretary on behalf of the United States asked of the Saudi Deputy Crown Prince and his government? I'm not going to, I don't have any additional detail about that part of the conversation than what was in the readout. Like specifically, is there more, do you get the sense there's more cooperation to be done with this specific case in the Saudis? We know that he, uh, Omar Mateen traveled there twice. Um, was there any request of the Saudis to see if he had done anything, you know, had been radicalized over there, or had any suspicious it, engagements over there? I'm not going to get ahead of, an open investigation, and I can assure you that the secretary's in, uh, dinner last night was not intended to do that either. In light of uh, the fact that uh, the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton called on the Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar in particular to stop fi funding these extremists and so on, was that in any way this topic 
or at least Saudi Arabia's portion of this. Uh, well, I think uh, the former secretary implicit. referred to citizens of right. citizens. those right. countries who uh, fund uh, 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 terrorist uh, networks. Again, I'm not going to go into any more detail from the readout. I, I can tell you that they talked about, he certainly talked about what happened in Orlando and the need to continue to press the fight against uh, terrorist groups. But regardless, look, go ahead. You know, can say these, citizens, funding, exactly. these funding drives happen People in public, are. you know, and uh, in, in full view of the governments. You know, they happen, they happen the in public. Yeah. their citizens to fund. Right. Well, yeah, again. That's, that's exactly it. Thank you. I'm not going to debate, as I've, not, as I've refused to debate comments made on the campaign trail, all right? And uh, that we all know that terrorist groups uh, get resources and get funding from a variety of sources. It's one of the reasons why, um, and you heard the President talk about this earlier today, that we're, that we're going so hard at uh, Dash's financing, because we know that that can put a stranglehold on their ability to operate and to resource themselves and to train and to equip and to sustain themselves. Um, uh, and we believe that all nations everywhere have an obligation uh, to do what they can uh, to try to combat the spread of terrorism and extremism through all manner of different efforts. And if you look at just the fight against Daesh, it exists on many levels. We often talk about the military level of effort, but we all know there's other levels of effort there. And we want all countries, and all countries who uh, are threatened by terrorism have a stake in this, to do what they can uh, to, help, to, help, to help limit uh, the ability of terrorist groups uh, to finance themselves, to resource themselves, to man themselves, and to operate. But that's – why can't you say then that the secretary then raised these very points with the Saudi – senior Saudi official he met yesterday? Because I'm not going to go into more detail than what I put in the readout of the dinner. Uh, well, out of, no, out of but, principle but, or what? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a meeting with an a incredibly important official from an incredibly important country in the Muslim world the day after a major terrorist attack. In, the United States. If, you, if you're asking me, have we, have we never raised the issue no, with Saudi not, officials? Of I'm course we have that. raised the issue. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stick with the readout. I know you guys don't like this readout. For some reason, this is really stuck in your craw. But that's the readout that I have from the dinner last night. And that's as far as we're going to go on it. And I'm not going to take any additional questions on the details of the dinner last night. Goyle. As this uh, ter terrorism is going on, many countries, many governments, and many – Goyle, let me stop you there. If you're going to ask about the dinner last night, you're going to be <laughs> sorely disappointed, my friend. <laughs> many people around the globe are shocked that – Ben, I can probably give you. Uh, – most powerful country like the U.S., all these things can happen, and uh, the – somebody, somewhere is providing weapons to these people, uh, ISIL or ISIS or whatever, uh, uh, with different uh, names they come up. And also, at the same time, much debate is going on uh, around the globe, including in India and here in the U.S., among think tanks, that uh, the funding, of, uh, just like you said earlier, is coming uh, in the name of charity, in the name of charity from Saudi Arabia, but because they want to keep terrorism out of their countries, but to other countries is okay. But my question is here, what the think tankers are asking, why can't we really stop these fundings and weapons, and uh, we had had so many summits and international uh, uh, organizations and all that. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a – it's a great question. It's also a very difficult one to answer. As I said, we, we recognize that terrorist organizations, whoever they are, uh, get resourced through many different ways, some of them donations. Not all of them, but not all their money comes from donations, but some do. Um, and we continue to press on countries around the world uh, to do what they can uh, to, to put a stop uh, uh, to whether, whether it's – whether they're, you know, implied loopholes that allow for this stuff to happen or express policies that don't prohibit it, whatever it is, uh, uh, to help us put a stop uh, to the ability uh, for individuals, entities, groups to fund terrorist networks. 
but we also have to recognize that donations are not the only source of revenue. As a matter of fact, you look at a group like Dash, and by and large, it's, uh, it's oil revenues uh, and uh, their own extortion. Uh, that is the, the largest manner in which they, they fund themselves, which is why we're going after the, you know, their, their, their oil revenues so much. So it's a complicated question to answer, and it's something we're, you know, we are constantly focused on. John, quickly, a diplomatic question, quickly. Uh, when Secretary meets so many, uh, his counterparts, foreign ministers and so forth, just like President meets uh, presidents and prime ministers, uh, you think uh, maybe Secretary may be thinking now to bring all these ambassadors and have a, a diplomatic talk with them uh, about these uh, individuals, they come from their countries? And well, brief, brief these ambassadors? And uh, input and output? There, I, uh, I don't know about a conference, Goyle, but I can tell you that they, these are conversations that we have all the time, routinely, with our counterparts all around the world. This is not a new topic of conversation. It's not something that we haven't uh, tried to tackle before or that we're going to give up on trying to tackle going forward. It's, it's something that we're very, very keenly focused on. Because um, only innocent people are a victim around the globe of these terrorists. Yes, they are. Thank you, sir. Uh, special representative for Afghanistan, Pakistan, Ambassador Richard Olson was in Afghanistan, Pakistan over the weekend and last week. Uh, do you know what were the issues they discussed? He discussed with the leaders of the two countries. I think we've already. Um... And did the issue of Tokaram border, the clash between Af Afghanistan and Pakistan's well, I, armies came up? I'm not going to. I don't have additional details to, to read out, but, uh, but uh, in Islamabad, uh, Ambassador Olson met with uh, government officials there, um, including the advisor to the Prime Minister on Foreign Affairs, the uh, Chief of the Army Staff, um, and he discussed a range of bilateral regional issues. Uh, in Kabul, he met with uh, Afghan government officials uh, to include President Ghani, Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah, uh, and the National Security Advisor uh, Atmar. Uh, he also met uh, with General Nicholson, again, to talk about... But the readout makes no reference to the tension between the two countries. When he was there, there was clashes between the uh, Afghan and Pakistani forces across the border, and one senior Pakistani army uh, official... I don't have killed. additional details to read out from his, from his conversations. I can tell you we are all watching uh, the tensions very closely, uh, that we are in touch with officials on both sides. We continue to urge uh, a calm resolution to the tension. Uh, we obviously don't want to see clashes. We don't want to see violence. We don't want to see it get worse. Um, and I can assure you that um, uh, that Ambassador Olson shares those sentiments. Now, I, I just don't have additional details to read out to you from those meetings. And secondly, on uh, in Karachi, in the, in the last few months, even last week, there have been few extrajudicial killings by the park rangers in the army. Are you aware about that? Um, I have, let me have Those are related to the MQM uh, leaders. Yeah, well, I can't speak specifically to those cases. Uh, I can tell you that we are concerned about reports of continuing extraditional, extrajudicial killings and deaths in custody as well as disappearances and abductions around the world. We raise these human rights concerns regularly in the bilateral discussions that we have across the region. We also encourage the investigation of all allegations of these kinds of violations and abuses in a manner that's transparent open to the public, and that meets international standards of human rights. We want to see these people being held to account. I don't have anything additional with these specific cases. Uh, there, there is a Leahy Amendment uh, which restricts the U.S. Uh, to provide civilian and military aid to uh, armies uh, which are involved in extrajudicial killings. Does this Leahy Amendment apply to Pakistan in this case? not going to speak to specific cases uh, on Leahy vetting. We don't, we don't do that. Um, but I can tell you that we fully apply the Leahy law in Pakistan, uh, and no aid to the Pakistani military can or does go to any units that are credibly implicated in abuses. So in this case, do you think the Pakistani army is involved in extrajudicial killing? I, I am not going to speak to specific cases, as I said. Okay, you had one? Yeah, a couple. Um, on Iran, um, an Iranian minister says that Iran has reached a deal to acquire Boeing aircraft. Um, do you know if that's true? And though I realize this is largely a Treasury matter, do you know if all U.S. government approvals required for such a deal to go through have been obtained? Okay. 
Uh, can maybe I think get so, to some of that um, without commenting on specific announcements by private companies. Uh, I would uh, remind you that under the JCPOA, we issued a statement of licensing policy that allowed for a case-by-case -case licensing of individuals and entities seeking to export, re-export, sell, lease, or transfer to Iran commercial, commercial passenger aircraft and associated parts and services exclusively for commercial passenger aviation. Although I can't speak to the specific report regarding Boeing, I can say that we have seen a number of major companies make tangible plans to take advantage of the new commercial opportunities afforded by the JCPOA. As we've said before, we're not going to stand in the way of permissible business uh, under the JCPOA with Iran, uh, and we are going to continue to do what we can to meet our commitments as long as Iran continues to meet their nuclear-related commitments. Beyond that, um, I'd have to refer you to uh, the private company. Okay, you, you can't then address whether or not Boeing has gotten a license right. I to can't. sell aircraft. That's okay. right, I can't. Then on the other issue of um, the JCPOA, um, Foreign Minister Zarif uh, is quoted as having said in Oslo that uh, he believes that the United States has uh, removed uh, sanctions on paper, but that it needs to do more to remove the, quote, psychological remnants, close quote, uh, <clears throat> that prevent uh, uh, banks from going ahead to lend. Um, uh, do you think he's right that you need to do more to address the non-legal barriers to trade? Uh, and is this going to be one of the main topics if the Secretary sees uh, him this week? Uh, I don't have anything on the Secretary's schedule to read out. What I would tell you is, is a couple of things on the first part of your question. Uh, we, we have and we will continue to meet all our obligations under the JCPOA. Uh, we have and we will stay. Uh, actively engaged uh, with partner governments in the private sector to clarify uh, the sanctions that were lifted on implementation day. Um, so to be crystal clear, the United States is not standing in the way, as I said on your earlier question uh, about uh, the uh, Boeing, we're not standing in the way, nor will we stand in the way uh, of uh, business that can be legitimately done and permitted with Iran since the JCPOA took effect. Um, and I think uh, as for psychological remnants, um, uh, it, it would be, uh, I, I think, fair uh, to remind um, that uh, what might help lift some of the, psycholo some of the psychological remnants, uh, to use that phrase, would be Iran's uh, ceasing the destabilizing activities that they continue to carry out, their su support for terrorism, which they continue to, uh, to, to foster. Um, so what makes business nervous, uh, what makes business reticent isn't some lack of education or effort by the United States, um, but when they see missiles being shipped to Hezbollah, missiles being fired at air, U.S. aircraft carriers and support to terrorist groups. That's what makes business nervous. Those are the psychological remnants which need to be lifted. Um, uh, has uh, the Legal Advisor's Office made any progress in its uh, continuation of its review of the uh, excising of the, uh, of the briefing? They continue to, um, to do their work. We're going to respect that process and, uh, and let them continue. I don't have any updates today. Can I, quick one I got time Iraq. for just uh, Iraq. Yeah. very quickly. Is there anything that you care to share with us on Fallujah, what is going on? in Fallujah because uh, Secretary of Defense Carter said that uh, uh, U.S. Apaches are involved in the fight against Daesh, and I was wondering whether they are involved in the fight against Daesh in Fallujah. Uh, I won't speak to I – ca I can't speak to DOD equity site. I know that um, uh, that the Iraqi security forces continue to try to move on uh, city center in Fallujah, which is w where the bulk of the Daesh forces remain. Um, I But I'm going to – push you over to the Defense Department for updates on the progress of that campaign. Thank you.